We are in session four of our exploration of the book of Job. And we are on the horns of a dilemma in a sense because we've been through round, we have these three friends. Job is in his turmoil. All his wealth and possessions have taken from him. And uh, now even his health, he's very painful, very, very uh, distressed and also puzzled. As why is all this happening? We have the benefit of that conversation between God and Satan that gives us some background that Job didn't have. But then Satan's final attack was not the health. His most vicious attack are these three friends and uh, these three comforters. They're going to go around three rounds of, of dialogue with Job. A bulk of the book are these dialogues between these three comforters, if I can call them that, and Job. And uh, we went through round one last time. We are in chapter 15. Now the dilemma I'm facing is if we go verse by verse, literally like we've always done with all our Bible studies, you know, we'll be in Job in the next summer. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, I have taught Job once where we just sort of did a one-hour summary of them all, and that was a little thin. And so what I've tried to budget ourselves here, we have tonight to sort of plunge into round two and three. That means in the hour or so that we're going to be together here, I'm going to try to skim through, not too superficially and yet in, uh, somewhat rapidly, 16 chapters. <laughs> because we're going to see second round starts at uh, uh, chapter 15, Eliphaz, who we heard last time, it's his second discourse. Then we have a couple of chapters of Job's reply to that one. Then chapter 18 is Bildad's second shot at it. And then Job's reply to that one. Then Zophar's second discourse in chapter 20 and Job's reply to that one. That finishes the second round. And then we have a third round. Eliphaz goes at it a final time and Job has a two-chapter reply to that one. And then Bildad is in at it again and Job replies to him. In fact, most people take chapters 26 through 31 as Job's final soliloquy. There are some scholars that suspect that Zoh buried in that is Zophar. You see, there's some translation problems and other things, but that Zophar may have had his third, which would make it more symmetric. Three guys, each has three shots, so to speak. But in any case, we're just going to jump in and get the flavor of this. The, the arguments, while incredibly eloquently expressed, especially in the Hebrew, are pretty much a broken record. And if we wade through it verse by verse by verse, you'll discover that it's not like they had lots of different angles. They really keep hammering away the same theme. Now, I will jump in and take Eliphaz's second round, starting in chapter 15. And you can follow with me, and I'll skip through a little bit in places. But anyway, the first six verses of this chapter, Eliphaz, the Temanite, uh, uh, charges Job with presumption. What's really interesting, these guys, see, Eliphaz, for example, when he started his first discourse, he was very polite, very courteous. He's the eloquent one of the three. But he, each time he's up, he's up to bat second time, you'll have a third one yet, he gets nastier and nastier. And they're accusing Job. Job says, hey, what have I done? His life speaks, you know, his life speaks uh, uh, well of him, and yet why is he suffering all this? And they're saying, obviously, because you've sinned. They can't grasp that there's other possibilities that, that this might not be Job's fault. But anyway, just jump in uh, Job uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite and said, Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? <laughs> Should he reason with unprofitable talk or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? Yea, thou castest off fear and restraineth prayer before God. For thy mouth uttereth thine iniquity, and thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. Thine own mouth condemneth thee. And not I, yea, thine own lips testify against thee. So now, he, well, although he started out courteously before, he's really thrusting deep here. And he accuses Job of all kinds of pretentious claims. I won't go through them verse by verse, verses 7 down through 13. Well, art thou the first man that was born, or wast thou made before the hills? Hast thou heard the secret of God? Dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? What knowest thou that, that we know not? What understand? So, see, it's getting these... these uh, the dialogues are quite eloquently expressed, but they're getting quite tense here. And what he's saying right down to verse 13 or so is, we have the same sources of knowledge uh, that you have. Why do you put us down and think yourself so smart? 
Now, what's strange about this dialogue is that Job didn't. You know, if you read, you know, if you recall, you know, Job, Job is not a hypocrite. He's very, very uh, self-conscious of the possibilities, but um, he just won't buy their, their premises. And so anyway, Eliphaz returns with his, as all his, his two buddies do, they, they, uh, they have this narrow and worn out theology. They have this basic premise that they assume is right and they, 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 they can't seem to uh, uh, you know, get out of that. And so uh, verse 14, what is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a womb, that he should be righteous. Behold, he, he puts no trust in his saints. He, yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water? <laughs> Who do you think he has in mind as he's talking about this nasty stuff? Job is a, by implication here. See, now again, one of the problems, one of the reasons this gets studied so much is that if you examine the premises of these three friends, there's nothing wrong with them. The theology is not wrong. Um, He's simply pointing out the general nature of man, the depravity of man, the fall, and its effects on human life, which is true. So you can't really fall this theology except to this sense. It's too narrow and it's being misapplied. See, no one's righteous before God. But, but see, he never once throughout all these discourses does he point to anything specific that Job has really done. He's just operating on the presumption that the uh, sinners suffer. And if he's suffering, he must be a sinner. You follow the logical fallacy that's there? It's interesting that God never charges Job with any fault until Job himself begins to see what's wrong. You're going to discover that these three guys don't change their tune all the way through these discourses. You will notice, if you studied carefully, that Job gradually is getting more insight. In fact, he's going to make some remarkable statements in chapter 19 when we get there. We'll come to that. See, they keep charging Job, but his life, Job's life, gives the lie to their charges. And uh, by the way, they too are guilty of these things that they're, that they, because they too are part of the human race. But Eliphaz is going to go on in a very long passage to argue just exactly what he did before, that the wicked are going to be punished, and therefore if you're being punished, you must be wicked. Now be careful. That sounds logical. It isn't logical. You see, and so uh, um, the murderer last night was left-handed. I'm left-handed, therefore I must be a murderer. You see a problem with that? Yeah. You see, it's not you know it's okay. It's all inclusive, in, exclusive. I won't get into the, I won't diagram it Boolean. You don't have to go to Boolean algebra to solve that kind of logic problem. It's pretty obvious. Okay, and uh, anyway. Uh, You've got to be careful those logic goes, well, I'm not going to drag you through the rest of chapter 15. Uh, Eliphaz goes on and on and on. In terms. Basically, that's the theme, although it's very eloquently, eloquently uh, uh, expressed. We get to Job, uh, to, uh, Job chapter 16. Job replies. In fact, he's going to spend two chapters on his reply. And he doesn't really know how to answer. But he is trying to be honest. See, the great thing you'll notice about Job all the way through here is that he's no hypocrite. He makes some statements that he later regrets and admits that they were rash. It's not that he's perfect. But on, on balance, he, he does better than any of us would, especially when you keep in mind the agony he's in. He's in pain. He's, 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 he's uh, in serious health problems. He's had everything stripped away from him for no apparent reason. But this biggest pain is why? Why? And uh, I love, I love Job. Job 16 comes right to it. And then Job answered and said, verse 2 of chapter 16, I have heard many things, miserable comforters are ye all. You know, <laughs> you know, if you've got friends like these guys, you don't need enemies. And yet as we go through this, as we go through this, keep in mind that you and I have been guilty of the very same thing they are. Applying platitudes, a narrow concept of theology in inappropriate places to people who are suffering. We're to weep with those that weep. Boy, <laughs> miserable governors, they sure are. Shall vain words have an end? Or what em emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as you do. If, if your soul were in my soul's stead, I would heap up words against you and shake mine head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth and... Uh, the moving of my lips would assuage your grief. 
Now, these are sarcastic words coming from a very, very tortured person. Now, Satan is using these three friends for what Paul would call the fiery darts of the evil one. Let's recognize that these three characters are unknowingly the instruments of Satan. Satan almost had, you can look at him as having three phases. He took all his possessions. Job did well. Satan complained to God. He won't change the ground rules. God said, you can do everything but touch his life. Now he's touched his life. He's still doing well, relatively. His final thrust are these three friends uttering what, fiery, what Paul calls fiery darts. And we need to be very careful ourselves whenever we find ourselves in a position of accusing a member of the body of Christ. The accuser of the brethren is a title of Satan. And there are people who publish, who are on the radio with programs, who make their career attacking the persons in the body. You know, I was on the board of, of an organization that Dr. Walter Martin founded called the Christian Research Institute. Uh, no real resemblance to the one today, by the way. But anyway, the point is, Walter made his living attacking false teaching. But he's very diligent. He never attacked the person when he was teaching. He would take the published doctrines of some group and compare it and show it why it wasn't biblical. Never attacked the person. And it's so easy to fall in the trap of, of attacking the person. And dangerous stuff. There are many people on the public scene that I don't happen to agree with their views on some things. But you don't attack them. They're, 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 if they're saved and they're members of the body of Christ, you don't attack the brethren. Accusing a brethren is what Satan's all about. So be, we all need to be very careful there. And there's also a procedure in Matthew 18, what we should do. If we have a fault with the brothers, you go, there's a whole a three-step procedure you go through. Don't do it behind their back. You don't do it in public. You do it with a brother to brother and so on. Anyway, Job goes on here then to state the facts as he understands them. He says, all I can conclude is that God must hate me. Now, he's wrong about that. See, Job isn't always right. He doesn't demean God. He th he's always conscious of God's majesty, but he is convinced that somehow God's upset with him. And he goes on through that uh, verses 6 through 9. He just, he just presumed that somehow God must be, be behind this widespread rejection of Job. Not only in his, in his health, but everybody is, is, is picking on him. Everybody is uh, rejecting him. And he go from verse 10 on, they, he talks about how they're, you know, they're, that he's upset that they, they just dismiss him. Get down to verse 17. Not for any injustice in mine hands also my prayer is pure. And he, he just doesn't understand it. But he is charging God with all that's wrong in his life. But you know what's great about that? God is so patient. He doesn't strike him down right there. He knows Job's hurting. Job is not the highest example of faith in the Scripture. We're not here to study how neat. Job did do pretty well on balance, better than probably any of us would have. But still, he's not perfect. He meant this is wrong. But it is candid and realistic in terms of how uh, uh, difficult it is for our, uh, when our natural view of life is shattered. We all have a worldview. We all have a set of presumptions. And when circumstances or whatever shatter that, that's tough. That's tough to deal with. God sometimes has to translate the theology that we have into painful experience before we really begin to grasp what he's trying to tell us. And that's part of what's going on here. He's allowing Job to go through this because Job is going to grow in this in some very interesting ways. That's pretty much the flavor of the rest of chapter 16. Let's pick up Job 17, where he continues his rebuttal here. See, despite the charges that he makes against God, he also recognizes that only God can provide the answer. He thinks God's against him for some reason. He doesn't demean God. He's constantly, uh, ev clearly uh, uh, evidences God's majesty and power. But he knows there's a mystery he can't solve. But he will gradually begin to realize that that solution will come from God to him. That's, in, that's, in, that's, in, uh, that's uh, see, uh, God often sends a trial to cause us to, uh, in fact, to wean us, if you will, from the dependence on other people and to find our resources totally in God himself. That's, that can be sometimes what's going on, and that is what's going on here. <laughs> now, what Job's going to do in chapter 17, he's going to pray that God will set him free. 
But you you know what he most wants to be free of? His three friends. (laughs) See, his final agony, aside from the physical hurt and so forth, is the agony of knowing that there's answers he doesn't have and knowing that these guys are not helping. And uh, (laughs) my breath is corrupt, my days are extinct, the graves are ready for me. Are there not mockers with me? And doth not mine eye continue in the provocation? Lay down now, put me in a surety with thee. Who is he that will strike hands with me? For thou hast hid their heart from understanding, therefore thou shalt not exalt them. He that speaketh flattery to his friends, even the eyes of the children shall fail. He hath made me also a byword of the people, and the aforetime I was as a tabernacle. Mine eye also is dimmed by reason of sorrow, and all my members are as a shadow. Upright men are astonished at this, and the innocent shall stir up himself against the hypocrite. The righteous shall also hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. But as for you all, do ye return and, and come now? For I cannot find one wise man among you. My days are past, my purposes are broken off, my thoughts, even the thoughts of my heart. They change the night and today the light is short because of darkness. I, if I wait, the grave is mine house. If I made my bed in darkness, I have said to corruption, thou art my father, and to the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. And where is now my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? They that go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together is in the dust. You know, this is eloquent stuff. It's, it's, almost, it's, it's disturbing a little bit to find ourselves in a situation where we're sort of skimming through it because the beauty of the book is incredible. The articulation is incredible. Uh, even in the translation, which is certainly imperfect. But in any case, uh, he, re- he, he responds to Eliphaz, second to course. Now we get Bildad steps up. <laughs> and he Bildad goes, just goes on the defensive, and he again just hits his narrow, rigid dogma. Then answered Bildad the Shuite and said, How long will it be ere ye make an end of words? Mark, and afterwards we shall speak. And wherefore we are counted as beasts and re- reputed violent. The whole thing's getting tenser, back and forth, less and less rational. And uh, uh, I, again, I, I, in this sort of time, we'll just skip through Bildad's babble here and uh, jump into Job 19, where Job replies to, to actually just to Bildad, all of them. And this, he, Job here is um, just a piteous play in which he's he, regarding his friends and the mystery of what on earth is going, happening to him. Then Job answered and said, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times have ye reproached me, ye have not as... Ash- are you are not ashamed that you make yourself strange to me, and be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remaineth with myself. If indeed ye magnify yourselves against me and plead against my, me, my reproach, know now that God hath overthrown me and hath compassed me with his head. He recognized that God's hand is, that's what's puzzling him about this whole thing. Now we're going to go on with these discourses, but so he glimpse ahead. These three guys, before the evening's over here, are going to be finished. The good news is we're going to get to the end of the words, okay? But there's a fourth guy that's going to show up next time. And I call him the mystery man. I won't, I won't say much more than that because we'll leave that for next time because scholars are divided as to who this guy is. Be, what makes him so conspicuous is that after he's through, God steps in and addresses all of them. And God takes these three friends of Job's and really puts them down, really nails them. And the mystery is he didn't, Discuss the fourth guy. Who is the fourth guy? What's he really say? Is he, what throws a lot of people is younger than the others. So we tend to dismiss him. He's a young guy. Well, uh, we'll see when we get there. So uh, I call him the mystery man. But anyway, we'll get through these three. Anyway, Job, Job is uh, uh, vexed, of course, for this whole thing. Uh, when you get down to verse 13, we say, he's, he gives us a vivid description of the isolation he feels, not just the pain of the disease and, and all this going through. You got a, you, you pus covered sores and all that stuff. It's a, is isolation. He hath put my brethren far from me and mine acquaintance are ye verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maids count me as a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. I called my servant. He gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth and my, my breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated her. I treat it for the children's sake of my own body. Yea, young children despise me. I rose and they spake against me. All my inward friends. And he goes on. I just, it's, it's bad stuff. Tough stuff. But it builds up here. He says, I've, uh, in verse 21, I've, I've escaped with the skin of my teeth. That's where the expression comes from. Verse 21. Have pity upon me. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends. The hand of God hath touched me. Why do ye persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? 
Notice verse 23 and 4. I, 24, I think this is kind of fun. He says, oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. Now, that's just a cry of a tortured man. I don't think he had any realization that his words would be. <laughs> we are reading them. They are penned in a book. They're most, one of the most famous books in history of man, the earliest book of the Bible. And uh, he, his, 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 his plea here was very literally fulfilled. But the real reason I wanted to uh, caution you here, because there's a, three verses that follow that are three of the most famous verses in the Old Testament. Don't let them slip by with, without recognizing how unique they are. We're in the oldest book of the Bible. We're in the Old Testament. And listen to what Job says. For I know that my... I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. He, he, he declares this statement of the bodily resurrection that he has a redeemer that lives. This sounds like New Testament stuff, doesn't it? This sounds like Paul. No, this is Job. The oldest book in the Bible. I know that my redeemer liveth, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. This is a this is a concept of Jesus Christ that eludes most churches. It's amazing how many churches do not dwell or focus or, or acknowledge that Christ is literally physically going to return to rule on the earth. He'll rule in our hearts. They, they allegorize it all the way. My Redeemer liveth, and they shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh. See, he's talking about a resurrection of the body. He's talking about the resurrection of the body, not some kind of spirit thing. He's talking about, in my flesh shall I see God. I remember as a kid, when the Revised Standard Version just came out, one of the commentators, they, they translated it, without my flesh shall I still see God. They, they destroy the whole thing by uh, twisting the Hebrew. And none of, the, none, of the, none of the other modern translations, I don't, I don't think, do that. They recognize the reality of what's here. It's a great treasure. Now, after my skin worms destroy the body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, who I shall see for myself and not another. And mine eyes shall behold not another, though my reins be consumed with me. And out of all this, he's saying, my heart fades within. He said, this, is, this is expression as, as earnest and as, as strong as can be said. It's one of the earliest de de declarations of the resurrection of the body, found in the word of God. See, Job, Job never fails in all his misstatements and, and agony. He never fails to see the majesty and power of God. And now he comes to the dawning realization that God is working out a great and mighty purpose and that God himself will ultimately be visible before men. That's what he's saying. And the fact that God is visible, the fact that there's a Redeemer, that there's a God-man involved is all implicit here. And that all that God has done will ultimately be vindicated, even though he doesn't see it right now. See, life is a mystery. And our problem is we can't comprehend it all because it's painted on too large a canvas. Can you imagine a small fly? Um, if, you've been to the, if you've been to the forest lawn, they have a painting of the crucifixion. I forget how long it is. It must be 60 or 80 feet long. It's a huge, huge painting. But can you imagine a fly crawling on that inch by inch, trying to make sense of it? You follow me? It'll see colors and brush strokes and, you know, it's, it's th the threads of the tapestry or whatever. It has no concept. If we, that's our problem in life. Life is painted on too large a canvas for us. But Job, despite his concern of the mystery, is beginning to trust God. And the trust, the whole thing, the, 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 the main lesson in the book of Job is that God is, the, that God is there. And Job begins to believe that he will, God will supply the answers he seek. Verse 28 continues about, Ye should say, Why persecute ye him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, the wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know that there is a judgment. By the way, uh, I, I did encounter a poem. Ray Stedman's commentary had a poem that uh, it's an unknown author, but it's, uh, it, it really summarizes Job to this point. Let me just indulge a quick poem here. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man, 
and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man, that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods, watch his ways. How, how he ruthlessly perfects, how he royally elects, how he hammers him and he hurts him, and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay, which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying, he and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks, when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses, <clears throat> with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try a splendor out. God knows what he's about. Authors unknown, but I think that's the message of Job to us. Well, let's give Zophar, the zealous, his answer. Job 20, he, he jumps in for his second shot at Job. See, and as we read the discourses of Job's comforters, we've got to be careful. We may recognize many of our own attitudes here. And we're, see, we're going to see the Pharisee here. The Pharisee, Pharisaism, if you will, can be generalized as orthodoxy without godliness. Outward rightness without in, with inward wrongness, if you will. So Zophar jumps into all this and he hammers away. I'll leave that for your reading assignment. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't make any profound points as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to move on. Let's just, let's just hear what Job says to him in reply, verse chapter 21. And here, this is, he, he, if you're going to take arguments to Job, you better have your arguments in order because Job cuts through it all. He's calm. Here now, in this case, uh, chapter 21 must have been part of the time when his pain wasn't quite as great because he seems very cold, very, you know, um, dispassionate. And uh, he begins with an appeal for a hearing. Job answered and said, Hear diligently my speech and let this be your consolations. Suffer me that I may speak. And after that I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint to man? If it were so, why should I not? Should not my spirit be troubled? Mark me and be astonished, and lay your hand upon your mouth. Even when I remember, I am afraid, and the trembling taketh hold on my my flesh. From chapter seven through thirteen, he's going to point out that the facts contradict what his friends are saying. In fact, his his the the entire life of the wicked is often untroubled one. See, they keep saying, you know, if you're if you're, you're hurt because because you're wicked because. You, I mean, and, and so forth. He points out, no, people who are wicked get along fine, many of them. That's not the point. I mean, where do, wherefore do the wicked live and become old, yea, and mighty in power? Their seed is established in their, own, in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. This is very similar, you know, to uh, Habakkuk. His anxiety in the book of Habakkuk. Why, you know, why is God... Um, so hard in Israel and Babylon's doing so well because well, Babylon's going to be God's instrument against Israel. It's the same similar kind of issue. And he goes on about this, how the wicked defy God and they still prosper. Verse 13, they spend their days in wealth and in a moment they go down to the grave. And it goes on like this. You get down, um, verse 18, they are stubble before the wind and as chaff the storm carrieth away. See, how seldom do the wicked really get their comeuppance? See, God's judgment seems to us very infrequent. Now and then you see it, but not as a general rule. The wicked prosper. Why did the wicked prosper? That's one of the, one of the big enigmas uh, in, 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 this, in this thing. And basically what he's going to argue through this is that life seems to be very unfair. If there is a good God, why does he let this kind of thing happen? And he elo very eloquently goes, uh, goes through all this. Um, he concludes, and how, how then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remain a falsehood. He's saying that your theology sounds good, but it doesn't fit the facts. We've got to be on guard on that. You know, the, the, most of uh, these, uh, you can take a piece of truth and overgeneralize it and end up with error, especially when it's misapplied. The wicked typically live above the law. The world system is very typically prostituted to the convenience of the elite. Even in this country, where we have probably landmark gains over human rights and other things in our culture. Even here, you watch uh, uh, the elite um, abuse the average people. Uh, you, know, you, can, you, you, can, you can commit murder and get away with it if you have enough money, enough power, enough pulse. Uh, you can be president of the United States and get away with the kinds of things that 
that uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, moving on. The third round. We've gone through two, uh, the second round. Now we've got one last round, the third round of this, starting at Job chapter 22. Eliphaz, again, leads on. He's the eloquent guy. But he finally loses his cool completely. Even Eliphaz, remember how polished and courteous he was in the first round? Well, he really answered, uh, uh, Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it a gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? By the way, Job never said he's perfect. They're, they're harping on this over and over again. He's, don't, don't fall on the trap. He never said he was. He never thought any of these things they're accusing him. Uh, he doesn't understand what God is doing, but he still sees God as a God of justice and righteousness. Eliphaz goes on, what, Will he repute thee for fear of thee? Uh, uh, will he enter it with thee into judgment? You know, Satan is always trying to get us to blame God for being unfair and uh, unjust. That, that, uh, that's what he's, that seems to be part of his agenda. Well, Alphaz continues, is not thy wickedness great and thy iniquities infinite? By the way, he's never accused him of anything specific. It's all these generalities trying to apply, he's trying to apply his preconceived solution to this problem. And be careful, we all do that. And we all do that. And there's several places here, like verse 18, where he's actually, Eliphaz is mimicking what Job said back in the previous chapter. Verse 18 of this chapter is the same as verse 16 of the previous chapter. There's an echoing, in effect, going on. Anyway, chapter 23, Job replies to all of this. And by the way, in the next two chapters, Job doesn't even try to answer the arguments anymore. He's had enough of all this stuff. He simply cries out from a troubled heart. And he's, he very eloquently tells them, and perhaps more directly God, how he feels. And Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he bleed against me with his great power? No, but, we, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. On the, and he hideth himself on the right hand, I cannot see him. And he knoweth the way that I might take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, this is a remarkable re a conviction of God's justice. He has no idea where he is. He doesn't understand why he can't reach him. And yet, when I shall come forth, I shall come forth as gold. He has a great deal of confidence that God is a God of justice. And he knows that God will explain it to him someday. So his, frustrated, his biggest frustration is he doesn't know why all this is going on, on the one hand. On the other hand, he has this conviction that there is a purpose in it, and God will ultimately be the one to explain it to him, not these three turkeys that have been spending all this time here for the last chapter. <laughs> and uh, my, foot, my, my foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept, and not declined, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Whew. Boy, that's all right. So he, he continues in this vein, right through chapter 24, he continues the same theme. Why is God silent, he's saying? Why, is, why doesn't he judge evil? He doesn't understand. He does, he, he's troubled by these mysteries. He says, why, seeing that times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they not know him? That, do they that know him not see his days? Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. You know what I mean by moving landmarks? That's what happened with Enrod. That's in the agricultural economy, the same thing as embezzlement, or what have you. You follow what I'm saying? And uh, they turn out the way of the, the poor of the earth, hide themselves together. Oh, they drive away the ass from the fathers, they take away the widow's ox for a pledge. And in other words, these guys are abusive. These powerful guys are abusive. And he goes through all these different things that they do, and yet they don't, they don't come to justice. They seem to, they seem to get away with it. He goes on like this right through the you know, first 20-some-odd verses. 
But there are two great questions that are nagging at Job all the way through here. Why is God absent where he's needed? And why is he so silent when he should speak? Those are the mysteries. Now, by the way, this is Job, the earliest book in the Bible. And he's not perfect. Peter and Paul both see evidences of these dilemmas. Both these dilemmas are evidences of God's patience and long-suffering. See, why is, why is he silent when he is needed? Why is he absent when he's needed? Because he's patient. He doesn't strike yet because he has a purpose in it. And why is he silent when he should speak? Because there's a purpose in it. And that's what uh, uh, that Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. He says, Oh, despisest thou the riches of goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So you don't despise the fact that, that God is patient. You don't hear him because he's patiently letting it play out. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That's what's happening to Job. Job's thinking this through, and you're going to see Job grow spiritually through these things chapter by chapter. Peter says the same thing, sort of, in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He's giving them a chance to repent of their own volition. You know, anyway, Job finishes it up and he says, though it be given him to be, in verse 23, chapter 24, though it be given him to be in safety whereon he resteth, yet his eyes upon their ways. They are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. They are taken out of the way as all other and cut off as the tops of the ears of corn. And if it be not so now, who will make me a liar and make my speech nothing worth? Well, Bildad now, he's going to take his third shot at this. And he, he continues with the same worn out arguments. And the good news about chapter 25, it's a short one, eight, six verses. So, and Job in effect replies. Now there is, there is a distinction here. Most commentators have chapter 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, Job's final soliloquy. That'll be the end of Job's comments. From there on it's the Lord's. But you'll notice there's, if, you, if you're watching this, we had, we had Eliphaz, Bildad, Zohar, and then uh, so far, and then uh, same three. We don't have a third uh, uh, discourse of so far. We'll have Eliph Eliphaz will speak, Job will reply, uh, 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 Bildad will speak. Uh, they believe, some scholars, primarily Bullinger, believes a segment of the sequence is actually so far's presentation a little later, spoken sarcastic. You know, the, the tone is different, obviously. And I'm not going to get into that too much except just to highlight it to you for your notes because there's some scholastic debate about that. Most expositors feel that the rest of the is the rest of this is Job's reply, and that Zophar never gets a third shot. Mullinger feels about verse eleven of chapter twenty-seven is where he starts for about a chapter. We'll get we'll deal that one and get there. That would provide symmetry. He may be right, but we'll see. But anyway, in in in, in, uh, <laughs> in chapter twenty-six, it seems that Job is hanging up the phone. He's his answer to Bildad is rich in irony. Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How hast savest thou the arm that hath no strength? Hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? How hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? To whom hast thou uttered words? And whose spirit came from thee? <laughs> Actually, Satan sent them, but God is still using them because he's using this for, for, for uh, Job's growth. And he goes on and, 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 and hammers away rather eloquently at, at our friend uh, and basically, he lists mysteries. God's going to talk, talk about his mysteries in a few chapters away. But he talks about uh, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him. The destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Wow. You know, any of us with a, a, a modern science background, that's very vivid. Can you imagine this being in the oldest book in the Bible? He hangeth the earth upon nothing. Wow. And Isaiah will talk about the severe of the earth. Interesting. He, he stretches out the north over the empty place. He hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters as in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He compassed the waters with the bounds till the day and the night come to an end. Pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he garnished the heavens, and his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. 
Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? In other words, Job is the gist of what he's saying. There are mysteries of God that no man can, can plumb them. But then he continues. As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and my Almighty has vexed my soul, and while, all, while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. You know, it's interesting you stand back. If you see, this probably was a play of the whole things in poetry except the opening and closing chapters. But can you visualize the eloquence on both sides as a play? You've got these three guys. Um, Eliphaz, the eloquent, then Bildad, and Zophar, uh, each one decreasing eloquence. But anyway, attacking all of them relatively eloquently, this one guy who's on this trash heap, hurting, bleeding, uh, near death, and he fends them all off. Fends them all off. We get down to about verse 11. Some scholars think verse 11 of chapter 27 is uh, Zophar's third discourse, and I won't try to build that one way or the other. And they typically assume that that uh, can be viewed that way uh, right on through. Well, let's just continue. If Job, in any case, chapter Job 29 is Job again, his final reply. And we have an extended soliloquy as to his fine, which is his final defense. He reviews everything that's happened to him, and he count, first the first thing he does is count his blessings. Can you imagine that? He undoubtedly does pretty well, but he still makes some rash and reckless statements that he later regrets and acknowledges uh, later. But uh, his suffering at this point is too deep to, to aim at any you know, arguing with these guys. He just simply seeks the truth. So Job continues, and oh, that I were, in, uh, were as in months past and in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head and when his light uh, and when by his light I walked through darkness. And he goes through, and really it's, it's, a, it's a recounting of his blessings. Boy, it goes on all the way through chapter 31. Um, we get chapter 31, he's, he's starting to search for a reason. And he's, but he, he has learned, as you watch his dialogue, that uh, to keep clean before uh, God, that in order to be, keep, be clean before his God, he has to be careful with what he allows his eyes to see. He makes a covenant with his eyes. Interesting. Verse, Job 31, verse 1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? What inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? I have walked with vanity. If my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. If my step be turned out of the way and my heart be uh, walked before, after mine eyes and if my blot hath cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out and so forth. But he goes on here, and uh, we'll find that there's no adultery in his life. There's no injustice to his servants. In verse 13, if I did despise the cause of a manservant, maidservant, when they were contended with me, when then shall I do, what shall I do when uh, God riseth up? When you get down to verse, after verse 15, no injustice to the poor and defenseless. Then he goes on for a dozen, half a dozen verses. Get down to verse 23, there's no trust in wealth. This doesn't mean he's perfect, but he, he, he recounts his record that... Uh, Verse 25, I, I, if I rejoiced because of my wealth, it was great, and because my hand hath gotten much. And he goes on, if I held, and then, uh, then he also talks about any secret idolatry. If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath secretly enticed, or my mouth has kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I would have denied that God is above. And he goes on about no gloating over the misfortune of others. If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him, Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. He goes on. He's not stingy with his wealth. He says, verse 31, if, my, if the men of my tabernacle said not, oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveler. And he goes on. No hypocrisy or secrets and so forth. In fact, even at the end, it's kind of interesting, he even, the last few verses of this chapter, he has not abused the land or caused any pollution. This is very relevant stuff. He's a good ecologist, in other words. 
And you finally get, after verse, in 40, verse 40, the words of Job are ended. And uh, now, we might talk a little bit. Uh, we've been a little cavalier just zipping through this, which is hurtful because it's so eloquently written, but we'd be at it all night. Um, we have generally two kinds of speakers. Those that have something to say and those that have to say something. <laughs> and these three guys are of the second kind. All three of these comforters were committed to the same fixed theory of life, that calamity is always the outcome of sin. It's a health and wealth gospel, by the way. There are major, major ministries on television that are locked into the same view of life. If you're sick, it's because you have not enough faith. Boy, I'd like to see them tell that to Paul, who was sick, and so on. See, they all measure things by this present life. Wrong, guys. They're all static. There's no advance in the views of the three friends. They all just eloquently remouth the same platitudes. You know, they change expressions, but the same... They all must justify Job at God's expense or vice versa. And they certainly aren't going to justify Job at God's expense. So they're all, that's, their, that's their thing. Eliphaz was based on observation. Bildad on tradition. Zophar on assumption. Eliphaz was a moralist. Bildad was a legalist. Zophar was a dogmatist. They're all close cousins. Eliphaz was an apologist. Bildad a lecturer. Zophar simply a bigot. But the good news is they're all finished. We're through with them. I, I've rushed through this hour to get them behind me because the, the rest of the book of Job to me is really fun. And so I have to admit that I'm glad to be through this. But uh, the first round, just to summarize them again, the three are, in, in the, uh, are one in the contention that God always prospers the upright and always punishes the perverse. And of course, Job simply re rebuts them from his own experience. In the second round, Eliphaz emphasizes that only the wicked suffer. Bildad insists that the wicked always suffer. Those are almost the same thing, not quite. And Zophar insists that any seeming prosperity of the wicked is short-lived. Those are all wrong. They're occasionally true, but certainly not a, a, a universal generality. And of course, Job rebuts each one of these guys from his own experience. And of course, in the third round, it's pretty much the same, except they're just more vehement. Uh, in their expression, and they're embroidered with evasive platitudes. And again, Job rebuts it with experiences. But if you intend to argue with Job, you better have your arguments well in hand, because he's able in each one of these rebuttals to cut through the logic, the, the logical errors of their position. And uh, their theology does not square with experience. It's their creed they have faith in rather than God himself. You can listen to that. They had faith in their beliefs rather than faith in God. There's a gigantic difference. It's a gigantic difference. A man with true experience is never at the mercy of a man with argument. Now, at this point in the book, we sort of sit where Job sits. The pressures, his riddles, uh, trouble us too. His questions he's raising bother us too because we don't have answers yet either. I think, though, we too have learned that God is larger than any theology that we might embrace. And uh, he's never inconsistent, never capricious. That's one of the gigantic differences between Allah of the, of the Quran and the God of the Bible. Allah is presented as capricious. He can do anything. God of the Bible, not so. He's always consistent, and he delights in making, keeping, and then keeping his promises. And he's loving. And uh, even though we may not understand what's happening, he probably finds a different way. I, I, always, I, I think he finds a different way every day to ask each of us, do you trust me? Sometimes they're subtle little things. Sometimes they're gigantic calamities. But he's asking the question, do you trust me? Job has had faith so far in the rule of God. But now he's begun to exercise his experience with a God that rules. And there's a difference. One's more intimate. Now, the other insight that we get from this is that Job's view of himself is um, still woefully inadequate. Job doesn't really understand. He's, he's, he's got an exemplary life. Even God, before Satan, gives him an A-plus on his report card. But he's still a sinner. Uh, he's been defending himself 
in these things. Uh, and I think he, like ourselves, still, you and I, have a too little of an understanding of sin's attack on us and the depravity of our own hearts. You and I do not really understand how depraved we really are. Jeremiah 17, 9, key verse. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. Think about that. That's quite a statement. The heart is deceitful above all things. And it says desperately wicked. The word isn't desperately. That's what's translated in the King James. It is incurably. You and I are incurably wicked. Nowhere in the Bible does God heal a heart. He replaces it. A new heart, I give you. That's what I mean, born again. It takes a creative act of God from scratch to make you worth something. We are not sons of God, we are sons of Adam. 1 John 1.11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, meaning a direct creation of God. That's in chapter 1 of John. He'll explain it in detail in John 3. Paul, by the way, also points out that there are depths that you and I are still not aware of. Paul says uh, in, um, um, let me get my reference here, yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. See, even Paul, with his consciousness of his own sin, realizes that he doesn't know the half of it. He doesn't know the half of it. Hey, we think we're pretty good. Oh, really? You don't know the half of it. Well, now from here on, the book takes a huge shift. We are at chapter 32. And what I'm going to ask you to do for next time is read chapter 32 through 37. And you're going to read the words of a young man that shows up. He hasn't been discussed so far. A guy by the name of Elihu. And um, he is a mystery. Some scholars feel he's just another critic, very similar to the other three. He's maybe more of an intercessor than a critic, I suggest. I think it's profoundly significant, but you won't discover this until you get after chapter 30, into chapter 38, because God, in chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41, and 40, the last few verses of this book we're going to spend the rest of our time on after next time, last few times, um, are incredible. God steps in, and we hear a little of His eloquence on this whole matter. And He's going to put, <laughs> put down these three guys, he mysteriously makes no comment about Elihu, which causes all kinds of interesting conjectures about what, what's, what's Elihu doing here? What's his situation? But then God will start with a science quiz. There are at least 15 major discoveries in science that have been hidden in the book of Job. Astonishing. There is more about the creation of the universe in Job than there is in Genesis. And we're going to spend a little time... <laughs> On dinosaurs. In fact, I'll try to set up an evil where we talk just about dinosaurs. Uh, strange stuff. Most of us who have read childish, you know, childhood tales of dragons breathing fire, most of us, we always assume those are just legends and myths. Uh, China is, is, the whole culture is preoccupied with fire breathing dragons. What will shake you up is to discover they're mentioned in Job, in the Word of God. And they're discovering that some of the dinosaur skulls have chambers that they didn't understand. They begin to understand it thanks to the bombardier beetle, that some of the dinosaurs apparently did breathe fire. And so it's going to, we'll get into some of that. It will take two, there's two chapters, the behemoth and the leviathan. One's a representative land creature, and the other one's a representative water creature, both gigantic. And there are people that believe there's some around still today in certain regions. We'll talk about that when we get there. So this, the point is, we have, we have, in my opinion, gone through the difficult part of the book, these di discourses. They're extensive, they're very eloquent, they're very fundamental, they're important. 
And yet, uh, I don't think we abused them too badly by just looking at them in a summary fashion. Uh, in any case, we certainly have set the, set the basis that you can in your own devotion just go through them and, and savor the eloquence of the expressions. But don't be disturbed as you go through because you'll realize as you read through, you cannot rebut the arguments of uh, Eliphaz or Bildad. It's not that they're wrong. What they're saying is technically true and yet being misapplied. So be sensitive to that, and, and the more time you spend on it, the more fruitful it will be. But for next time, we start shifting gears. We'll, we'll have the last of the discourses, so to speak, with Elihu. And he has a, he has a lot of little, lot, there's a lot hidden there. And then we get to the, what I consider the fun part. God himself in uh, chapter 38 and 39, 40, 41. And then the surprise ending in chapter 42. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. I always need to feel I have to apologize for being so superficial for these critical chapters, and yet I hope that we've done enough so that you get the flavor of them, and enough that you can savor a little bit of the eloquence and at the same time get a flavor of what the issues are. I encourage you, if you feel that you've been shortchanged a little bit, just to read them verse by verse of yourself next time, for next time. But uh, focus on the Elihu for the next session. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Job. We thank you for its lessons, Father. Indeed, we come before your throne acknowledging that we too are guilty of the arrogance and the presumptions and, yes, the ingratitude that is expressed by Job's comforters. And, Father, we grieve too that we too have probably been so often much less a comfort to those that are hurting because of our the narrowness of our horizon, the blinders that we wear, the prejudices that hide us from truth. We pray, Father, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and lives to your word, that we're, we encounter those that are hurting, that we weep the, with those that hurt, and that we never, never lose sight of your, the, your magnitude, majesty, the magnitude of your power, and of your love and your patience. Help us to remember, Father, that where you appear to be slow to act, it's because you're being merciful. That where you are silent, it's because you're teaching us to appreciate what we have and to seek the next step. We pray, Father, that you would just uh, continue to be patient with us. But above all, Father, we thank you that you've gone to such extremes to bring us a Redeemer that shall indeed be alive here on the earth. And that we too, Father, shall see you in our flesh, even though our reins are consumed within us. We thank you, Father, that you have a destiny for us that is so fantastic, there's just nothing we can do to earn it. We, we thank you, Father, for increasing our awareness of our depravity, our awareness of how desperately we need you, how without you we are nothing. But also help us, Father, as we stagger in awe at the extremes that you've gone to that we might have a future far beyond our imagining. We thank you, Father, for Job. We do pray, Father, that you would minister to us in the dark valleys that we're in or maybe ahead of us, Father. We thank you, Father, that each of these are for our learning and for our strengthening and that you have a purpose in them, even though we may not know that purpose. We thank you, Father, that you are a loving Father, that you love us beyond our imagining. We thank you, Father, that you care enough for us to draw us into intimacy with you, which is beyond accounting. So, Father, as we go forth, we pray that you would just uh, continue to help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of you and Jesus Christ of whom sent. For, Father, we just thank you and we commit ourselves without reservation into your hands in his most holy name. 
And Father, we do pray for each one here that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives, that you would lift the veil, let us see what you would have us see, Father. Let us not be myopic. Let us not miss. Let, let's not be short-sighted, Father, in what, in what you have for us. And help us, Father, each of us, that the lessons that we're learning not be wasted, but that we provide for our growth. We do pray, too, Father, for your travel mercies as we go home. The roads are slick. The time is late. We do pray, Father, that you just watch over each of us and keep us from harm as we commit ourselves into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.